Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 390 of... Uh, I didn't even do that right. Uh, uh, <clears throat> one more time. <laughs> Three, two, one. Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 390. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 2nd of May, 2018, the Feast of St. Athanasius, who knew how to keep the church clean and true. And... Um, Welcome to Anglican Unscripted. Yeah, we're not even worthy to record today with uh, Ignatius. That's a, that, I had forgotten that was today. Yeah, Actually, Athanasius today. Yeah. Uh, Brilliant. Well, I, I mean, listen, it's not that I forget many feast days. It's the fasting days I seem to forget quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's why I love to remember the feast days, because I get some virtue out of it, and I so easily forget the fast days like yes. you. <laughs> Uh, I want to do a quick update. Uh, a lot of times in the last uh, spring, you showed up with an eye patch. Uh, mm. You were not playing a pirate, but uh, some people have been emailing. What's the update on Gavin's eye? Uh, is he healed? Is he going to uh, be blind? What's going on? I said, well, let's find out from Gavin. What's the what's the uh, the latest update on the eye? Well, Kevin, it's really it's very good. I went to see an eye doctor this morning, and um, she looked into the eye and said, f "For an eye that's had a retina detached twice and the macula fall off completely, you're lucky to have any sight at all." Um, what you have is really pretty pretty good in those circumstances. Um, it's quite frightening to look in the eye. They really have lasered round the whole thing. And uh, at some point they said, are you getting any flashing lights? And I said, I, I am getting flashing lights. I didn't really want to tell them. Um, but it turns out this isn't a sign of, of the end of the age. This is um, this is the scleral buckle. So they've, they've put a uh, they, they, they put a tie around the eyeball to make it look like a rugby ball instead of a soccer ball, which means the retina is more likely to stay on. And and I can see it. Um, or, so when I close my eyes and it's dark, this thing you know, this thing is there, which either means it, it, it could mean one of three things. One, the Lord is coming back and the universe is imploding. Two, I'm about to get the, the worst of all migraines you ever had. Or oh, no. well, three, someone's tied a scleral buckle around my Bible. <laughs> so luckily it's the latter. <laughs> but the good news is that the eye, eye has now settled down. These glasses are useless because they belong to, uh, first of all, I sat on my old glasses when I was in my pirate stage <laughs> these these are a prescription from way back when um and uh and so i've now settled down enough to get a new prescription and in a fortnight's time i shall be looking um more alert <laughs> that's good well my, our apologies right now to anybody who was eating food while watching that uh, quick update uh eye stuff that's all squirmy to me you know i'm not sure if i told you they're supposed to anesthetize my eye for when they did a cat they took the cataract in the middle and this guy came to me to to to, to do a final anesthetic with a a needle which he stuck into my eye and I mean, I nearly hit him. I, I very nearly killed him. And I, I said, Nick, if you ever do that again, you'll have to hold me back with a male nurse because <laughs> I nearly killed you. <laughs> oh, that, that and, wasn't very nice. And on to our next story, more confessions of a bishop. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, when was the last time somebody hit you for stabbing them in the eye with a needle? And he said, yeah, only, only, only the people on drugs do that. Or you. <laughs> or you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Gavin and I are going to move on to a more serious story. Um, I don't know if you guys have followed it here in America, but over in uh, Britain the last couple of weeks, uh, Alfie Evans has been in the news. Um, Alfie is a child who uh, was born normally, had some medical conditions that were made worse by some viruses, uh, went to the hospital a couple of times, and eventually uh, sustained some brain damage from this. Uh, to what extent the doctors clearly admit, hey, we don't know uh, the extent of his brain damage. But at some point, it was decided uh, by the National Health Service in Britain that for all intents and purposes, we offer the best care. We can't care for him. Uh, perhaps it's time that the, uh, uh, the state, the parents, the doctors uh, kind of discontinue care and, and let Alfie go on to a, a better place. Uh, which is just uh, our right as a state to do. Well, Alfie's parents didn't like that decision and wanted to find, which any parent, I'm a parent of three, I would do this, 
better care, better options, better hope somewhere else. And uh, this is 2018. There's a lot of medical technology and uh, medical advancements around the world um, that you can go to and, and try and seek a better outcome. The, uh, the state of uh, national health care in uh, Britain said, nah, listen, we do offer the best. We do love Elfie more than you, and we're not going to let you take him. So this is where I have to bring a person like Gavin on and, and tell me what's going on. Why does your state not let people make their own decisions? Um, why are doctors' um, orders more important than uh, parents' orders? So help me out. Why can't people escape British healthcare? And Kevin, the last time you asked me this, which was a week ago, I said, I'm not answering. I don't know enough about it. <laughs> and one of the things that's happened between then and now is I've, I've found out a great deal more about it. Um, it's a complicated question because there are three elements involved. Um, the first element is the rights of a parent. The second is the medical prognosis. And the third is the role of the British courts. Um, if we do the medical prognosis for a moment, um, one of the background pieces of information is that about two years ago, uh, some parents had a child with an, an, an advanced brain tumour. Um, and they were convinced that there was treatment in Hungary that would cure the child. And the doctors here said no. Uh, and a huge legal tussle took place and they managed with great difficulty and in the face of great public criticism to remove their child from the National Health Service. They took it to Hungary and the child has recovered and is flourishing. What? It's absolutely. <laughs> oh, uh, I did not know that. So, I'm a little bit more well, upset this is, now. It's just, it's just, well, indeed. But however, the, the medical situation, there is no comparison between that medical case and this medical case. Uh, I think everyone agreed that Alfie was going to die. So the only question was how long, where he was going to die and how long he was going to take to die and, and in what manner. And then it got quite complicated because the hospital said, well, we're now going to take him off life support and we expect him to die immediately. Uh, and, um, uh, and the parents, and it's clearly their right to do that. Of course, they have, you know, the idea of life support is quite complicated. But the next thing that happened was Alfie didn't die. So then the hospital said, OK, we're going to kill him. <laughs> we'll put him on what's called the Liverpool pathway, which means that you you remove all nutrients and water. Um, and, and effectively, that's euthanasia. So Alfie's parents at this point were hysterical with grief and anxiety, understandably. Um, and at this moment, um, the Pope, so they're Catholics. Uh, and the issue of euthanasia raises the thing to another level in the ethical spectrum, and I think perhaps explains why the Pope got involved. And so the Pope said, with the Italian government's help, we'll make Al Alfie an Italian citizen, you can bring him here, and we will care for him. Now, nobody knew whether that care would last 24 hours, 24 days, 24 months, um, probably 24 hours, But none, and the parents said, yes, please. And at that point, the the doctors refused to let him go and they brought in the, the courts so 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 first of all you have to ask why are the doctors refusing to let him go i apologize it seems to be lawn mowing day at the condo if this doesn't shut off quick i'll i'll go close the window quicker and, uh, well you, you keep talking i'll just turn i'll mute my volume but my question is you mentioned catholic a couple times here and i'm like this is Britain. If this kid were Muslim and had to go to Saudi Arabia, done, go. If this were a royal, uh, somebody uh, uh, like the, uh, the new baby born to, to Kate and William, go, have fun. Uh, yeah, it's a much yes. different circumstance. It, it is, and indeed, um, one of our best commentators, Adrian Hilton, who runs the blog spot, Archbishop Cranmer, uh, wrote making exactly that point and said that if the of his parents had been Muslims and they wanted to fly to Saudi Arabia uh, and there was an element of, of uh, spiritual or religious component in their need to take the child there, uh, there's no question but the, the culture of the times is the courts would have allowed it. So why didn't the courts allow it? Well now, now it gets more complicated um, because uh, the, uh, the judge who didn't allow it happens to be an LGBT activist. 
So, and he's written some fairly uh, important judicial papers on the, on both gay rights and the rights of families. He's a family lawyer, otherwise he wouldn't be a judge in this case. Now, he doesn't like the Christian Legal Center. Christian Legal Center uh, is um, is not Catholic. I, I, I'm not sure if I'm right to call it evangelical, but it's it's passionate and orthodox. Uh, and this particular judge would not like a passionate and orthodox Christian uh, legal body who defend Christians against uh, oppression from progressive LGBT agencies. And um, and indeed, the next day, it turned out he invited all the he invited some journalists to hear his judgment. In the, they had no right to be there, but he invited them in. And the next day, in the press, particularly the Times, there was a really horrid assault on the Christian Legal Center, calling them fundamentalists. Uh, the reporter looked at one of the guys and said, "Did you know this man wrote a book about desert warfare in 2002, and it was panned by the critics?" I mean. How can we possibly trust an organization that lets a man who wrote a book on desert, you know, the whole thing was, was, was so crazy. Yes. So at, at this point, you have to begin to say, we're moving back into the area of, if not conspiracy, then certainly rank prejudice. Uh, and why, why, was, why were Alfie's parents not allowed, at the very least, to fulfill their parental duty and say, please allow us to care for him in the last hours or days of his life? Now, it could very well be that um, he, he might have lived a little bit longer, but it, it was chilling that the state chose for medical and legal reasons to say no, when many commentators without a dog in a fight looked at this and said, surely the rights of the parents come first, given he's not going to live very long, and the parents need to be able to feel they've done everything they can for him. It's the way God created us. Uh, yeah. the desire, the inerrant desire to do everything humanly, spiritually, physically possible uh, for the longevity of your children. It's its there. It's in the DNA. Uh, God so loved the world, he sent his only son, that all those who believe in him should not perish. The, the, the desire to protect your children from perishing comes it is because we're in the image of God. This was a holy and a divine response of theirs. And, and it was chilling that both the medical establishment and the legal establishment, on the grounds of what looks like anti-Christian, anti-Orthodox Christian prejudice, uh, set out to deny them this. Yeah, I, it doesn't seem to me that you know your average doctor within the system is anti-Christian. I think this just gets to a point where somebody who is going to make the final decision uh, in a family court uh, may or may not be uh, anti-Christian, and boom, that's where things start to fall apart and it rolls out of control, and the British okay, press and it, you know, have I, their day. And I'd like to, and I'd like to distance myself from sure. some of the. American commentators I saw commentating on this mm. because you you know you're exactly right you you set it in a better context than I did uh, this initially this was just a power struggle mm. so and, and whenever there's a power struggle people like to win so the doctors like to win because yeah. they're the professionals they mm. you know that's understandable it became anti-christian the moment Alfie's parents said look we're catholics and we have the pope's help and we want to take him you know to, to Italy this is a um, this is a Catholic Christian emotional uh, venture and I think the combination of that with a Christian legal center, legal center being heard by a judge who is in who who might be thought or suspected to be hesitant about the role they play in society that's that's when it moved from being a simple power struggle to having elements of uh, of being anti-church anti-Christian anti-parent Next story. You went to a conference last week where you were a speaker. Um, it was called the Anglican Patrimony Conference. Now, before people run to the dictionary, <laughs> it means <laughs> what we've inherited through Anglicanism o over time. Um, how was the conference? It was a very important conference, Kevin, and one I've been looking forward to for a long time. And it was organized by somebody that many of your viewers know, love and respect, uh, Bishop Michael Nazir Ali. Uh, along with John Hind, the previous Bishop of Chichester. And together they brought um, to Oxford a number of people, uh, including an American theologian called Stephen Rutt, who um, 
was presenting a paper on someone no one had ever heard of, well I hadn't heard of, that's not no one, but called Roland Allen. Roland Allen was uh, in, in, in 1909 resigned as a vicar saying he could no longer in conscience stand up and conduct baptisms and funerals when quite clearly the English parishioners didn't mean the words that he that they, that they were required to mean and so he he, he became a missionary in china a very uh, honorable and powerful missionary but 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 continued his line of thinking which was uh, at what point does a church's relationship with the state mean that good christians have to act outside the church itself uh, and although i don't think he was right to resign in 1909 over funerals <laughs> um I think the the way in which he saw the issues is is helped us enormously as we look at the way in which the Church of England has surrendered to secular culture. So many people now are asking, can I go on serving Christ faithfully inside a church which is giving way to secular culture, denying biblical truth and denying what the Holy Spirit has taught us through tradition? Uh, or must I must I leave a church like that? And that was the question we set out to ask ourselves over a period of two days. So a Church of England clergyman quit the Church of England because it was the state church, and went to the Chinese state church. No, he went to he went to a missionary. In China. Okay. he went to convert people to Jesus. <laughs> I, just, I wanted to get <laughs> this straight because <laughs> the it, one it was, church was, worse than the Church of England I could think of was the no, state no, church. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, this was 1909. Well, 1920s. He also he ended up in Africa. Okay. Uh, this was before the communist revolution. Yes, it is. So he, right. he he had to flee the Boxer Rebellion. It was that that's it was that period. Um, so so no, it wasn't what he was flying it fleeing into. Uh, although he went from China to Africa. Uh, it, it was what he was fleeing from in terms of whether or not he could in all conscience exercise a ministry uh, in a church that placed state and secular values before gospel values. Well, your story is not much different. You certainly left the your position as a chaplain to the Queen and uh, your position within the Church of England uh, for reasons with which I can't serve anymore here. This is, well, they, they have taken a, enough of a turn that you, you said, I got to go. I, I, when I read his letter of resignation, I, I said, "Oh my goodness! I wished I'd wished I'd read this before, because I could have looked so noble, so erudite, so spiritual. If only I had access to this very competent man, because he said it all so much better than I did." Um, but but yes, I was very struck by the fact that he and I had come to the same conclusion for very similar reasons, although the immediate cultural context is different. But mm. it, it was the same, and. Um, uh, and I thought that um, it was very wise of Michael Nazir Ali to, to, to use him as a catalyst for our own thought. And Stephen Rutt, who was the theologian who presented him most clearly, did a really excellent job. Uh, and then we began to talk about whether or not there was, you know, how much, how much more road there was left within the Church of England for people who put the gospel and the teaching of Jesus first. Uh, and I, I think we came to the conclusion that that we'd run out of road. Yeah. Uh, and so at the very end, the question then came, so what do we do? Uh, and, um, and at that point, to avoid anything too radical or too upsetting, <laughs> a decision was reached. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But bearing in mind, this was an Anglican patrimony conference. This is your line, Kevin. <laughs> yes, so I, I want you to tell the decision before I give them my line. <laughs> <laughs> they decided they would send it back to the committee that had originally planned the conference. <laughs> that is what we've inherited from Anglicanism. Back to the committee. We have finally had the greatest speech ever. We are motivated to go. Let's go back to committee and make sure we're allowed to go. Yeah, that's Anglican, Anglican Patrimony 101. Uh, now we wow. need to pray for the people who will convene the committee. Uh, <laughs> that, they, that all the wisdom stilled by this event. Yeah. Uh, and if people want to know what was said, some of the papers uh, and some of the talks are, are recorded. And they're up on um, uh, an, the Anglican Patrimony Oxford website. Um, we might try and find the exact link to put up. Yeah, if you could send uh, it to I, me, I'll put it in the show notes here. Uh, and, and I put my own contribution in, in a typically 
normal narcissistic way on my own website yeah uh, which it's also available <laughs> we're fighting outside with a weed whacker so we do need to, to close shop here for today before i do the first thing i wrote down i'm going to uh, use this as the last thing we need you to have liked the episode um even if you didn't like the episode just accidentally click the thumbs up button on there um share it you know Kevin, one, yeah Athenasians would not be proud of that we, no. we have just <laughs> slipped for the highest standards on the feces that uh, you can't get away with that no, you can't. So why, not, why not why not like it on the grounds that other people might like it even if you didn't Very, that would be <laughs> see this is what you, uh, gavin's right you may or may not like it but other people might like it. And when you click like, uh, Google and YouTube automatically says, well, if one person likes it, we will up it in our search categories. And when people search for Anglican, they're more likely to get Anglican unscripted. Well, right now, it's probably the only choice out there, sadly. Um, <laughs> share. Uh, the one thing you guys do, I, I see everybody likes it. I see everybody subscribes. we got almost 3,000 subscribers. A lot of people are commenting. But I know there's not a lot of people sharing. And I feel your embarrassment for you, because when you share it, you kind of admitted that you watched it, and that's that's hard. I I completely understand. See if there's a way you can share anonymously. You know, look what somebody sent me. I haven't watched it yet. Something like that. You know, and uh, that would certainly be a way to uh, to avoid your embarrassment of loving our program. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and you in the company of St. Athanasius have been watching episode 390 of Anglican Unscripted.